on uh, September the 13th. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Brian Lynn. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up, Andrew Smith presents Ask a Teacher. We also have Words and Their Stories from Ana Mateo. And we close the show with an American story. But first... During his more than 60-year acting career, James Earl Jones's voice became a star of its own. Jones died this week at the age of 93. One of Jones's career decisions continues to be an issue of debate. His permission to let artificial intelligence, AI, reproduce his performances as Darth Vader for new projects. Skywalker Sound and Ukrainian software company Respeecher used AI to recreate Jones's Darth Vader for the 2022 show Obi-Wan Kenobi. The show appears on the streaming service Disney+. Plus. The voice of actor Mark Hamill was also de-aged using Respeecher. Hamill played Luke Skywalker in the first Star Wars movie. His AI-manufactured voice was used in the series television show The Mandalorian. Disney Plus launched the show in 2019. Voice actors say they fear AI could reduce the number of jobs because the technology can reproduce one performance into many. The concern led American unionized video game performers to go on strike in July. For some observers, Jones's decision to permit AI to reproduce his voice raises questions about voice acting as an art. But the decision could also help develop AI agreements that fairly pay actors for AI-based performances. Zeke Alton is a voice actor and member of SAG-AFTRA's Interactive Media Agreement Negotiating Committee. He said it is amazing that Jones was involved in the process of reproducing his voice. If the game companies, the movie companies, gave the consent, compensation, transparency to every actor that they gave James Earl Jones, we wouldn't be on strike, Alton said. It proves that they can do it. They just don't want to for people that they feel don't have the leverage to bargain for themselves. Hollywood's video game performers called for a strike after more than 18 months of negotiations over a new interactive media agreement with industry leaders. The negotiators could not reach an agreement on artificial intelligence protections. Members of the union have said they are not opposed to AI. They say they are worried, however, that technology could replace them. Concerns over such use of AI were among the reasons that film and television workers went on strike last year. The work stoppages went on for four months. Neither Skywalker Sound nor Respeecher answered a request for comment from Associated Press reporters. 
but a sound editor with Skywalker Sound spoke to Vanity Fair magazine about the issue. The worker reported that Jones approved the use of old recordings to keep Darth Vader alive. The worker added that Jones guided the new performances. Jones's contract could set an example of properly bargaining with an actor over their likeness, said Sarah El Male. She is chair of SAG-AFTRA's Interactive Negotiating Committee. El Male, a voice actor, said there is a chance for these tools to be used in meaningful, smart, artistic decisions. Hello. This week on Ask a Teacher, we answer a question from Renata in Brazil about the usage of the words perhaps and maybe. Dear teacher, I'm trying to learn English, but from now I have a question about what's the difference between perhaps and maybe. Thank you for writing to us, Renata. I'm happy to answer this question. The two words mean the same thing. We use them to express the idea that we are guessing or unsure about something. However, there are some differences in how we use the two words. Language researchers use the corpus of contemporary American English to study the usage of words. They have found that speakers of American English use maybe more than twice as often as the word perhaps. The corpus contains over one billion words collected from American print video, and audio media. Here is an example of the use of maybe. Are you going to the beach this weekend? Maybe, but I need to check the weather first. In this situation, if a speaker used the word perhaps instead of maybe, it might sound too formal or serious in American English. However, in written English, we often use the word perhaps instead of maybe. You can find many examples of both of these words in stories on our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. In writing, we can use commas to place the word perhaps between phrases or clauses in a sentence. Consider this example. It is easy, perhaps, to train a young dog to obey its owner, but training an older dog might not be so easy. Note that if we put the word maybe in place of perhaps in this writing example, it might not seem like good writing to a native speaker. Sometimes a writer will choose to use the word maybe instead of perhaps to communicate a particular feeling. Consider the following example. Government officials say the new trade deal will help the economies of both countries. Maybe. Such predictions have often been wrong in the past. Here, by using the word maybe, the writer communicates more strongly a feeling that the government officials 
might be wrong. Finally, be careful not to confuse the adverb maybe with the verb phrase may be. You can learn more about this by reading the Ask a Teacher program called Maybe and Maybe Are Driving Me Crazy. For our readers and listeners, do you have a question about American English? Perhaps you would like to know how American English has changed over the years. Or maybe you just need to know how to use particular words. Whatever your question may be, send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Andrew Smith. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. In life, there are times when we lose our way, both literally and figuratively. We might get lost walking in the woods or sailing at sea. Those are examples of being literally lost. We could also lose our way while on our career path. That is an example of being figuratively lost. If you are physically lost and do not have a compass, you could use the stars in the night sky to know which way to go, especially the North Star. Experts at NASA, America's space agency, say this about the North Star. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it can help you orient yourself and find your way, as it's located in the direction of true north, or geographic north, as opposed to magnetic north. They add that the North Star is not the brightest star in the sky, but it is usually easy to see, even from cities. The North Star can also help if you get lost figuratively. As the world changes around you and grows more complex, you can look to your North Star to help guide you. Your North Star can help keep you focused and on track. It reminds you of what is important. Some people may say their North Star is their guiding light. It is something very important to them, and it keeps them on the right path. Your North Star can also be your personal mission statement. It can include your principles and guiding beliefs. Your North Star can give your life meaning and direction. For some people, their North Star may be a religion. For others, it might be a purpose, like teaching people to read. Or a North Star can be a mix of important things. A similar term for North Star is your moral compass. Like the North Star, a moral compass points you in the right direction. There is another term that is linked to the North Star. A lodestar is also a star which is used to find one's way. And it can also mean a person who serves as an inspiration, model, or guide. The Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary explains that both meanings of lodestar date back to the 1300s. The English poet Geoffrey Chaucer 
used both meanings of the word in his poems. However, by the 1600s, the literal meaning fell out of common use. Today, we still use lodestar in a figurative way, meaning something or someone who guides us. During a difficult or important time, many things can act as your north star or lodestar. For example, when a woman went through a difficult divorce, her close friend was her lodestar and helped her through it. Another example might be when a music teacher and musician moved to a new city. He did not know anyone. He felt lost and alone. So music was his north star. It kept him busy, provided him with employment, and later led to great friendships with other musicians. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. You just heard Ana Mateo present this week's Words and Their Stories. Now she is here to chat about her report. Good to see you, Anna. Hi, Katie. Thanks for inviting me back. I'm going to try to use North Star in a sentence. You go for it. Okay. The podcast is our North Star in learning American English. Wow. That's a big claim, Katie. Mm, too much? How about the podcast is a North Star in learning American English? I think all of us at VOA Learning English hope to be a North Star for people learning English. In other words, we hope they can count on us for informative and entertaining content that helps them learn English. Thanks for coming on the show, Anna, and for another great Words and Their Stories. Goodbye. Thanks, Katie. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 5 I was stunned. Auguste Dupin, my friend with the extraordinarily sharp mind and observational powers, still had surprises for me. He had uncovered so much about the horrifying Rue Morgue murders that it seemed there was more understanding than mystery left. But still, the major question remained. Who... Dupin had invited someone to our home. Someone he believed knew the answer to that question. As we awaited his arrival, my friend began to put together other pieces of evidence from the crime. We add for our consideration the condition of the room. So we have a strength more than human, a wildness less than human, a murder without reason, horror beyond human understanding, and, finally, a voice without a recognizable language. A cold feeling went up and down my back. A madman, Dupin. Someone who has lost his mind. Only a madman could have done these murders. Dupin smiled a little. Ah, but madmen come from one country or another, don't they? Their cries may be terrible, but they are made of words, and some of the words can be understood. Let me help with one more clue. Look at this hair. I took it from the fingers of the old woman. Is this the hair of a madman? 
Dupin handed me the evidence. I could not believe what I was looking at or the feel of it in my hands. Dupin, what is this? This hair is... This hair is not from a human at all. I described it only as hair. But also, look at this picture. It is a picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The doctor said these marks were made by fingers. Let me spread the paper on the table before us. Try to put your fingers all at the same time on the picture so that your hand and its fingers will fit the picture of the marks on the daughter's neck. The marks left by the killer's hands were enormous. My fingers seemed like twigs in comparison. Dupin, these marks were made by no human hand. No, they were not. I am guessing they are from the hand of an orangutan. The size, strength, and wildness of these apes is well known. And the hair and strange sounds would complete the solution of killer animal as well. Yet, I still do not understand the second voice. We know it was a French-speaking man. His only words were, Mon Dieu. Who spoke, Dupin? Upon those two words, I have placed my hopes of finding a full solution to the crime. The, my God, was an expression of horror. It seems improbable that the speaker of those words helped the orangutan. Could he instead be its owner? Maybe the animal escaped from him and he followed it to the house on the Rue Morgue. I assume that the man would not have been able to recapture it. Is that who we are waiting for now, Dupin? The Frenchman? How did you reach him? My friend smiled when he answered. I put an ad in the newspaper. Read it yourself. I took the newspaper. Caught early in the morning of the 7th of this month. A very large orangutan. The owner, who is known to be a sailor, may have the animal again if he can prove it is his. But, Dupin, how can you know that the man is a sailor? I do not know it. I simply suspect. A sailor could go up that pole on the side of the house. Sailors travel to faraway lands where one might find an orangutan. And it would be valuable. The sailor would want it back, so... Finally, Dupin, we learn the whole truth. Come in, my friend. Come in. Slowly, the door opened, and there, before us, stood a sailor. He spoke in French. Bonsoir. Good evening to you, too, my friend. I suppose you have come to ask about the orangutan. Yes. Is it here? No, no. We have no place for it here, if you can prove it is yours. But of course I can. A shame. I wish I could keep it. It is very valuable, I guess. Well, I want it back, of course. I will pay you for your trouble to find it and keep it. What is your price? Well, that is very fair indeed, but it is not money I want, sir. My price is truth. Tell me everything you know about the murders in the Rue Morgue. The sailor's face reddened deeply. He jumped to his feet. For a moment he stood and stared. But then he fell back into his chair, trembling. His face grew pale, his eyes closed, and he said not a word. Dupin then spoke softly. My friend, you must not be afraid. We are not going to hurt you. I know very well that you yourself are not the killer. 
but it is true that you know something about him, or about it. You've done nothing wrong. You didn't even take any of the money. You have no reason to be afraid to talk and to tell the truth. It is a matter of honor for you to tell all you know. So help me God. I... I'll tell you all I know. About a year ago, our ship sailed to the far east, to the island of Borneo. The forest there, the jungle, was thick with trees and other plants, and hot and wet and dark. My friend and I wanted to explore the strange place, so we did. There we saw the orangutan and caught it, and it returned with us to the ship. My friend died on the passage home, so the animal became mine alone. I was keeping it in a cage in my house here in Paris. I planned to sell it very soon. One night, I came home, and it was... it was loose. It had got free, I don't know how. It held a knife in its hands. It did not know of its dangers, of course. It was playing with it. As soon as the animal saw me, it jumped up and ran from the house. I followed. It ran several blocks and turned a corner. When I made the same turn, the animal was out of sight. I looked far down the street and saw nothing. Then I heard a noise above me. There was the beast, climbing a pole up the side of a house. It was maybe two meters up. I also went up the pole. As I am a sailor, it was easy for me. When the animal was close to the top, I saw him jump through an open window. I got to the same place, but could not make the jump. I could see into the room, however, through another window, which was closed. The two women were sitting there, looking at papers from a box on the floor. The animal, knife still in hand, made a noise, and the old woman turned. That is when I heard the first of those terrible cries. I watched with horror as the animal attacked. Soon the two were dead, and the room was a disaster. The orangutan then pushed the young woman's body up the chimney. It picked up the other victim then and moved toward the window. I realized what was coming, and I fled. Down the pipe, I scrambled. At the bottom, I heard the old woman's body hit the ground. I ran. I didn't look back. I ran. Oh, mon Dieu, mon Dieu. The police in Paris could not charge the sailor. His only wrongdoing was silence, which is not a criminal offense, the police chief said. However, the official did have a problem with Dupin. He was angry that Dupin, and not a member of his force, had solved the mystery. He said people should mind their own business. Let him complain. He'll feel better for it, and maybe learn something. Perhaps he will never again say not possible about that which, somehow, must be possible. That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Brian Lynn.